Todd's accomplishments musically at the head of an organization as part of a hospital is really an extraordinary thing and very wonderful. Um, okay, I'm going to dive right in. Um, so as far back as we can go in recorded human history, the arts have been part of culture. So the oldest musical instruments, cave paintings, burial jewelry, all date from at least 30 to 50,000 years ago. The arts are part of every human society, and there is no place on earth where humans don't have their own music, their own visual art, and their own dance. The scientific exploration of the human mind is much younger. It really began just a little over 100 years ago, and it's accelerated in the past few decades, especially with the development of neuroimaging, and continues to grow as the technology improves. Understanding the human mind has definitely become one of the frontiers of the 21st century. And as a result, creativity is being studied both cognitively and neurologically. And the arts and sciences are converging in some very interesting and powerful ways. Drawing on this research, I'd like to talk to you tonight about the science and art of creativity. This research is particularly timely and important, I feel, because by and large, the arts are being pushed periphery in both education and in our society. They're too often treated as a luxury, and arts education is a matter of special opportunity for privilege. This is particularly true in public schools. It's particularly true in Texas public schools, where standardized testing is playing such a large role. And the primary purpose of my talk is to delve into two questions using brain science. Why do minds need art, and do we still need them? So the concepts that I'm going to describe are, drawn, are primarily inspired by the neuroscientist David Eagleman, whose book, Incognito, I highly recommend, describes the inner workings of our subconscious, and the cognitive scientists Mark Turner and Gilles Favignet, who were the first researchers to propose a unified model of creativity. And my work grows out of theirs. So David Eagleman describes our mental lives as consisting of two basic types of behavior, automated behavior and mediated behavior. Automated behavior is based on pruning. Your brain streamlines neural networks. The goal is reliability and efficiency, a predictable outcome every time. Automated behavior can be innate or learned. So innate would be things like your heartbeat, breathing, dilation of your pupils, pulling your hand away from a hot stove, anything we call a reflex or an instinct. Learn would be things like multiplication tables, spelling, the recognition of familiar faces. So when you see a parent or a mate, your brain is not looking through every human face you've ever seen in order to recognize the person. It's actually streaming the network so the recognition is almost instantaneous. Uh, automated behavior is why habits are so difficult to break, because your brain, or your brain has literally pruned away the options. So for instance, uh, male zebra finches are songbirds, and the young males are born with the ability to sing any melody in the flock, but they learn their family song from their fathers, and there's a tutoring period that lasts several months, and at the end of that time, the young males have mastered one song, and they'll sing that same song their whole lives. Their vocal calls have become automated, and if you look at finch brains, when they are young, they have this rich network, like a cloud of neurons, in the area having to do with vocal learning. And as they learn their father's song, it literally gets pruned down to just a few branches. So it's, it's quite explicitly been seen in, the, in those brains. And similarly, human infants are born with the ability to produce all the phonemes of the world's languages. And then in the first six to eight months of life, they prune away the phonemes they don't hear that are being used by their parents uh, that aren't part of their native language. And that's why Japanese speakers have trouble with the letter L in English, and English speakers have trouble with things like the Russian sh sound of U, which is totally not used by us. So the value of automated behavior is competency and expertise. And it functions most effectively when it is unconscious. So shooting free throws in basketball is an automated task. You just practice it, and there's nothing stopping you from getting the free throw. But of course, the opposing fans try to distract the player to get them to think about how important it is that they make the free throw, and thereby miss, because they're forcing somebody to become conscious. And the same principle is used in icing the kicker in football. 
Uh, if the kicker just gets to go out there and kick the field goal, they don't think about it, they do it as automated behavior, but give them a minute to realize that the game is on the line and they might miss. Uh, also, jinxing. So, you know, you say, uh, the, your kid says to you, oh, I've driven home safely 20 times in a row. You say, don't jinx that. Because you're making something conscious, and by doing so, you might mess it up. So, the modular view of the brain arises largely from automated behavior. The brain has dedicated some single localized network to a particular task, and if that network is damaged by injury or disease, you will lose that function. Automated behavior, we share that with every living being with the brain. So, what's mediated behavior? The mediated behavior, the brain tolerates redundancy and promotes networking. Instead of pruning, it allows multiple networks to negotiate and work out a solution to a problem. Eagleman called, oh sorry, the goal in this case is flexibility and innovation. Multiple outcomes are possible. Eagleman calls this the team of rivals model of the brain and likens it to a parliamentary debate. Whereas automated behavior is almost completely unconscious, mediated behavior can be conscious. Your conscious mind overhears and participates in the internal conversation of our thoughts. Human beings have an extraordinary ability for mediated behavior. It's what distinguishes us from every other living being. Mediated behavior is the neurological basis of creativity. It gives us our capacity to innovate. Novelist and essayist Arthur Kessler define creativity as the defeat of habit through originality. And that is actually neurologically a perfect description. Automated behavior creates habits, mediated behavior breaks them. So zebra finches, their vocal calls are completely automated, and they are incapable of learning a new song once they have mastered the single song that they'll learn for life. Whereas thanks to mediated behavior, human beings are of course able to learn new languages. So, there has been a prevailing view that creativity is primarily a right brain activity, and that's part of the modular view of the brain. But recent neuroimaging has shown that different creative tasks recruit different brain regions. Creativity basically recruits the brain regions that it needs for whatever it's trying to accomplish. And creativity is widely dispersed in the brain, not just localized in the right hemisphere. Your left hemisphere is just as involved as your right hemisphere. It's all about network. It's all about creative behavior. Now, Automated and mediated behavior are implicated and they're tangled up in almost everything that we do. So for instance, in synchronized swimming, it takes mediated behavior to choreograph the routine, but then of course it takes automated behavior to do the execution absolutely perfect. <laughs>
The model begins with two assertions. First of all, the human brain is not capable of producing something out of nothing. Creativity draws on prior experience. Now that's, of course, a hard thing to prove. How do you prove that you can't do something out of nothing? But I'll, I'll suggest one thing to you. There's something no man can ever know about a woman. And that is what it's like to have four color rods in your arm. So no man on the planet has four rods, and a small percentage of women have a fourth color rod. So they see a million more colors than is capable of any of the rest of us in the population are capable of seeing. And they have no way of expressing to us what that's like. And we have no way of imagining it. You just look at the auditorium and imagine it in a million different colors, and you can't really do it. You're sort of build whatever you've got out of who you are and what you're capable of experiencing. As wild as our imaginations are, we are limited and cannot just come up with something out of thin air. Um, and then the second assumption is under the terms I'm going to use, an exact copy involves no creativity. So if I copy your computer file, I'm not being creative. And similarly, an assembly line, its goal is faithful reproduction. Uh, accomplished as reliably and efficiently as possible, and it's an automated process, not capable of innovation. So from those two assumptions, I'm going to say that creativity involves an alteration of some kind. And I want to describe it as involving three basic types of alteration. The first one I call bending. In bending, an original is twisted out of shape or transformed in some way. The second is breaking. An original is shattered into pieces, and something new is made out of some or all of the pieces. And the third one is blending. Two or more sources are merged. And my proposition is that all creativity can be described as involving some combination of these three types of alteration. For instance, in the visual arts, Monet's 30 plus paintings of the Rouen Cathedral showing its facade in different lighting are examples of bending. And so are Hokusai's 36 views of Mount Fuji. Here is Edvard Munch's The Scream. And here are three bent versions, the yawn, the pout, and the sock. <laughs> These sculptures all bend the human form. Here are three versions of obelisks from different parts of the world. And now we've got Barnett Newman's broken obelisk, in which he snapped an obelisk in half and flipped it upside down. So this is an example of breaking. And mosaics are created by breaking. So is stained glass. Cubism is another example of breaking. An image is broken into multiple perspectives. And here are some visual examples of blends. So in the Assyrian sculpture, you have a human head and an animal body. In the Greek Minotaur, you have an animal head and a human body. And then here in this uh, photograph by Lane Ganesh, you've got now a, a different sort of blend where you, of course, have a pile of gravel for the head and the human body. Uh, blends can involve any number of sources. So for instance, collages will have multiple images. This is Jasper Johns' Racing Thoughts. Cartoons are often a great way to visualize blends. So if you blend the mathematical symbol for infinity, with kids on a long car ride, you get infinity with children. Are we there yet? And if you blend sky riding with Riker's block, you get sky riding block. <laughs> so in architecture, uh, Frank Gehry's Blue Robo Center for Brain Health is an example of bending. Uh, Ram Pool House's CCTV building in Beijing is an example of breaking. There's a big hole where you would expect to find more offices. And uh, IMK's pyramid in the middle of the Louvre is an example of blending. In film, fast motion is an example of bending. And of course, if fast motion is an example of bending, so is slow motion.
And you'll see that breaking uh, is absolutely an essential technique used to create the sound.
entire passage just out of that one little piece. Look like a turquoise pendant in a black velvet sky. 
He's blending, obviously, a piece of jewelry with an astronomical object, our planet. And Martin Luther King's very beautiful blend, the art of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So we see the three Bs all around us. Uh, in design, for instance, here's three different types of chairs, all taking the basic form of a chair and bending it. Um, the relief picture of Mariano Rivera, when he was when he retired, was given as a present by the Minnesota Twins, a rocking chair made up of broken bats, in tribute to all the bats he had broken in his career. And uh, here's an example of a blend, a spa chair. It's not even good enough to get a massage chair anymore, but a spa chair. Uh, V4, V6, V8 engine, all examples of bends in a car. You take out the brakes and use them as brake drums. Uh, in percussion, you're, you're breaking that out, one piece of it, and using it for something else. And of course, a gas electric hybrid is an example of a blend. Um, some uh, gadgets and technology. Here's some bends. These are all futuristic coffee makers. Uh, how about these futuristic watches? Um, this, as an example of breaking, is a very clever idea. It's a modular cast that allows for joint motion even when you're in the break. So it's individual pieces snapped together. Um, and here's an interesting blend uh, GPS into a windshield. Uh, in politics, oh, sorry, one more, uh, sound balls. So these are light balls that are also wireless loudspeakers. So you put them in their ceiling, and they connect with your uh, you know, iPod, stereo, and such and so forth, and broadcast uh, sound into your living room. In politics, uh, democratic elections are an example of bending, because you have government institution, the same institution, but now filled by new people. War, of course, is an example of breaking. And I guess shutting down the government also qualifies as president. <laughs> uh, and the United Nations is an example of a blend. In biology, genetic mutation in the lab has produced seedless oranges. Uh, gene splicing has replaced faulty genes with healthy ones as a uh, treatment for pancreatitis. And there are some interesting blends, the source and the liver. These are real. Uh, and in fact, uh, part of the advantage is uh, they carry the, the resistance of one of the species into the other. So I think the source, uh, the zebra, protects the horse part of the animal from certain uh, uh, predators. Um, in math, hyperbolic space is bent geometry. And there's a wonderful TED talk by Margaret Erdheim where she shows that crocheting was the solution to a 400 year old mathematical riddle how to visualize hyperbolic space. Uh, of course, fractions are an example of breaking. So with prime factoring, you take a large number and you break it into its primes. And Fourier transformation, where you take a complex sound wave and you break it down into its component waves, that's very important for cell phone reception, for instance, which I wish somebody would tell AT&T that. But, um, <laughs> uh, then diagram is an example of blends. And graphs enable you to blend multiple variables or correlate them together. So the goal of the three Bs is to just help us to describe all innovative behavior, anything that creates new outcomes. So now that takes me to the part where I want to give some reasons why minds need art. Of course, these aren't all the reasons mine need art, but these are some of the ones that what I presented to you would help to support. So most buildings hide their ventilation, their plumbing, and their elevator shafts, of course. But if you've ever seen the Pompidou Center in Paris, that puts it all on the outside. So the air conditioning, the ventilation, the plumbing, everything's on the exterior of the building. So similarly, creativity is, is often hidden and not easily uncovered. So this is, a, this is a YouTube video I downloaded from the web. And what happened to YouTube was that viewers greatly prefer high definition video. But it often causes your computer to freeze because it's too many bytes being jammed into the band. And uh, YouTube discovered that if your computer freezes, you've got about two seconds worth of patience and then you click away and you're, you're gone. You're on some other site. So they were desperate to answer the need for the high definition vi video, but also find a solution to the bandwidth problem. The problem was that bandwidth